started? Could we uh, get everyone to see it just like a show them the Yes. So. I'll just call it. Okay. I'm going to give a two-minute warning, and if our legislators could come up to the front, we're going to talk about the mics. Okay, and we are right at 11, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to set this aside, and then I'm going to ask you to finish up any conversations. Please feel free to still grab coffee, grab donuts. I um, always buy way more donuts than I think will get consumed. Uh, I, I operate off of if you don't have too much, you don't have enough. So I just want to welcome you. This is actually our 10th year hosting these legislative coffees. Um, I've been lucky enough to participate in all of them. And uh, I really thank you for taking time out of your Saturday. It is a cold day, so that probably helped with attendance. But I like to think you'd be here no matter what. Uh, so just some quick housekeeping. We're going to open with three minutes per legislator. That is their time to use, however they see fit, to share with you um, what's going on at the Capitol. I have a couple of requests for all of you please no shouting out even if you have a follow-up question if you have a follow-up question we've got these in your chair uh, write that question down somebody will be around to collect it uh, just hold it up when you're ready no clapping and definitely no booing I'm sure that won't be a problem but <laughs> just as a reminder and then please submit all of your questions on the cards in your chair um, try and write legibly and in the form of a question I can't ask your question if I can't read it or can't understand it we also give preference to the most commonly asked questions and preference to questions with a wider audience. Um, and then on your chairs, you'll see a sheet that says follow up. That's how you can contact all of the legislators that have participated in the legislative coffees, including the ones sitting here today. So um, if I didn't get to your question or uh, you did have a follow up question, that's how you would do that. So I just want to end with a statistic. 93% of Americans believe that incivility is an issue in America currently. Um, and then that same study shows that we all agree mutual respect is the path forward. So I would like this program to be an example of mutual respect and a path forward. And with that, we're going to get started. Um, Representative Featherston, would you like to get going with your... Okay. Good morning. I'm Linda Featherston. I represent House District 16, which is in Overland Park from the mall to the community college and down to the Edward campus. I'm the ranking member on local government. I serve on water, education, and agriculture committees. Do anything else? Or? Okay. Oh, well, you, if you have anything you just want to talk about going on, you're welcome to do that. You don't have to. Well... Union Station, mass shooting, that's what we got. There are other things, book bands. I had book bands, solar panels, and a uh, farm-to-food bank bill that kept me in Topeka on Wednesday, for which I am very 
thankful and um, I'm trying to think of something nice to say. We did have something good happen in water this week to kind of give our groundwater management districts a, a, a second warning that they should start implementing a plan to conserve water or the legislature would be doing it for them. Very nice. I am Allison Hoagland. I represent House District 15, which is um, in Olathe. It takes in the, the old core of the town, which I was born there, so that's the part that was there when I was here. <laughs> um, we also have a little chunk of um, Spring Hill Township, and then I go across the interstate to take in Mid-American Nazarene University. Um, I am on legislative modernization child welfare and foster care, welfare reform, and elections. Um, something we have coming up, um, we passed through committee, it'll go to the floor in elections, is um, to get rid of the Monday before, for early voting, um, the Monday right before election day, because there are some counties, one lady came in and her county is 800 square miles, and it takes her an hour and a half to get around to the next voting station. There are only seven voting stations in the entire 800 square mile area. So I felt for her, and I realized that that would be hard to get the machines out to the locations, um, but we are um, requiring uh, four hours of Saturday voting to make up for the Monday voting being gone. Um, it, didn't seem like a big deal to me, but some of the other districts or different counties don't have any Saturday hours at all. So this is gonna be great for the people there. Um, rather than give them a, another weekday that they can come in, they'll have some hours on Saturday. Um, welfare reform is an interesting committee. Um, they brought forth a bill to make sure that Kansas could never participate in summer EBT. Um, because, you know, feeding hungry children is Apparently not a great idea. Um, anyway, it's a challenging committee, um, but I'm, I'm there. I'm representing um, a, the good side of uh, the world, and uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Senator Dinah Sykes. I represent the 21st Senate District, which you are in, so welcome to my district. Um, it is the majority of Lenexa with redistricting. Um, I have a large chunk of Miriam, a small chunk of Shawnee, and then kind of the downtown Overland Park area. So I also serve as the Senate Democratic leader, um, leading our Democrats in the Senate. Um, I serve so on LCC, which is Legislative Coordinating Council, the State Finance Council, and then I am ranking on education, and then I'm um, vice chair on confirmation oversight. So this year, uh, we kind of started out with a bang with um, tax bill um, right out of the gate. And um, now we are waiting. And are we on week four or week five? I've lost count um, of trying, Republicans trying to, six? Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, <laughs> of Republicans trying to um, get the votes to, um, to overturn the governor's veto on that. And they have been unsuccessful up um, until this point. Um, we have until the end of this week, and then the clock stops in the House. Um, I don't think they have the votes, but I'm still, and we are working to be able to sustain that veto. Um, so that really had put a hold on a lot of other issues um, in the Senate, because kind of waiting for that, and the Senate president trying to make sure that um, stopping things or so that he can make sure he has the votes he needs um, to overturn that veto. Um, we have been working on the budget um, recently in those committees. Um, I actually got to sit in on the Ag Committee 
um, because one of our members was sick, and I know about that farm to table because I was there to make sure it was in the budget um, on the Senate side. Um, and actually, that was probably one of my more enjoyable days of the Senate so far this year because um, we were able to do a lot of good work in that ag committee. And you know, being a Johnson County girl, um, I did grow up in Tennessee, so it was fun to um, have the aspect of you know the larger state and being able to. Um, vote for the voices of our farmers and agricultural members there. But um, so in budget committees, um, we, so there's a lot that's been happening um, on education. This just on Thursday, we cut probably a hundred million dollars out of our um, education budget, all increases to SPED funding. There is several one-time money um, for our children's cabinet, working for child care centers, making sure that um, we're able to get up to codes. So there's grants there, um, and all of that was stripped out of the committee. So I think it was short-sighted. I think it was reckless, um, and we will fight to get those back in. Um, also, in our higher ed budget, there was a lot of one-time money put in there. And one of those that is very near and dear to me was $75 million for our KU Cancer Center. Um, we have that NHI designation and all of these things. Part of that is making sure that we have a larger place so that researchers and doctors can be together. And so there's some private money that was going to match dollar for dollar a $75 million um, investment from the state. And I Ethan, do you remember the total dollar of that? Um, it was a fraction of the cost, so a really a good investment. And all of that got stripped. So it's been a really discouraging um, session so far, but I think in the end maybe we will try to come and piece some of these things back. Um, we have one week until turnaround, so everything is supposed to pass one house or the other, and that's on Friday. And, you know, I'm hearing rumors from our speaker and president that if they don't get their way on a tax plan, we're going to pass a budget and we're going to be done. And so I hope that's not the case because there's a lot of issues that really touch um, the lives of Kansans that we should be addressing. And because um, someone's maybe not getting their way or they're afraid they're not going to get away, they're going to take their ball and go home. So look forward to your questions. All right. Hey, I'm Senator Ethan Corson. I represent Northeast Johnson County in the Kansas Senate. So my district goes from about 47th Street, which is the Johnson Wyandotte County line, out to about 95th Street. And then I go from state line to just a little bit west of Metcalf. So that's kind of all those small municipalities in Northeast Johnson County, and then part of Leewood and part of Overland Park. Um, I'm a member of the Senate Tax Committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate Utilities Committee, the Senate Transportation Committee, and the Legislative Post Audit Committee. Um, but I do just want to start with the events of Wednesday and what happened. I, I just want to talk briefly about that because I, I was not there. I was sitting in the Senate Utilities Committee when I started getting just a series of, of panicked phone calls and text messages from my wife who was there. and. You know, the thing that really struck me about it is I really don't think we can say that we're surprised anymore when these things happen. Um, I think the more accurate way to think about it is that because of our inactions in the public policy space, we have collectively decided that we are okay with having a society and a community where there are routinely school shootings where there are routinely shootings at shopping centers, where there are shootings at parades and other community gatherings. It really wasn't surprising. It was horrifying. It was tragic. It was a lot of other things. But the thing that's been most difficult to me is that I've had a number of constituents reach out and ask, what can the legislature do to try to take action to curb this? And these three colleagues have been tremendous leaders on this issue. And the hard thing for me and the most disappointing thing has been trying to explain to my constituents that the overwhelming likelihood is that the Kansas legislature will do nothing in response to these tragedies that we continue to see in our communities. And I would just encourage folks that if this is an issue that's important to you, if this is an issue that you wanna see prioritized in Topeka, 
all 165 state legislators are up for election this November. And I'm not encouraging you to vote for a particular party or particular candidate, but I think that if this is an issue that we would like to see action on, it's important that all of you understand where candidates are on the issue of common sense gun safety. Um, how much time do I have left? <laughs> oh, you're not even timing. Okay. Well, okay, great. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll turn to my committee. So I'm on the Senate Tax Committee, as Leader Sykes mentioned. You know, this is a committee that's been kind of prolific in years past in terms of the number of bills that we pass out. We really have not passed any tax bills out this year because we are all waiting to see what happens with uh, the flat taxes, as, as Leader Sykes uh, mentioned. So we've had some good bills and some bad bills in tax committees, some good bills that would provide really needed property tax relief to our fixed income seniors and our disabled veterans, and some bad bills that would, that would hamper local control. But again, we have not passed those bills out of committee because we're all waiting to see what happens with the flat tax. Uh, in the Judiciary Committee, uh, we've done some good work on strengthening criminal penalties, and this had just passed the full Senate on Thursday of strengthening criminal penalties around fentanyl, which is uh, obviously a real challenge across the state and, and in our community in particular. So I was happy to support that. Uh, there also, though, is a bill in the committee that I want to let you know about, which is it's a fetal personhood bill. So it, it sounds somewhat innocuous, but it, it would say that um, you can collect child support on a fetus from the moment of conception. So it's, it's a kind of a backdoor way to overturn what the Supreme Court has said with respect to abortion and what Kansas voters, in particular voters in my community, said on August 2nd of 2022. Um, so I'm, I'm tracking that bill closely. Uh, in the Senate Utilities Committee, we've got a bill that would make it harder to close coal plants. Uh, which I oppose because I think that's the wrong direction for us to be going as a state. Uh, and then in transportation, I'll just close briefly. A little bit of a bright spot. We passed uh, out bills that would allow you all to get a personalized license plate for the Kansas City Chiefs and for Sporting Kansas City. And we also, the full Senate on Thursday, passed a bill that is sort of the first step in uh, putting a passenger rail line from Newton, Kansas, through Wichita to Oklahoma City, which I think would be really cool for the state. So I'll end on some good news, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. I got a reminder, I forgot to mention that we invite every single representative and senator with constituents in Johnson County. So if you don't see someone on that sheet that you want to hear from, feel free. I've reached out to all of them already, but sometimes hearing from you, that, that changes some minds or, or gets some uh, butts and chairs and you know we're happy to add anyone I I don't if somebody says they want to join I just add them on I don't say no uh, so also I forgot to mention representative Woodard let me know that he is sick today so that is why he is on that sheet and not here uh, we will reschedule with him so we're gonna get going on questions what is the most hopeful thing that has happened so far this session In response to um, ending summer EBT for the state of Kansas, um, my friends and I brought forth a bill to provide lunch and breakfast for all Kansas students. Um, because that makes more sense and would, would definitely be a better thing for our state. I think in the Senate, um, we've only really worked bills one day, and it was on Thursday, and I would say probably the passenger rail, um, because that is, um, you know, helping people, um, you know, transportation, and we can go all the way to California from Kansas City, but not south, so I do think that was a bipartisan piece of legislation. I would echo what Senator Sykes said. I think the passenger rail is a really cool opportunity for us. Uh, there's a lot of federal money available to help help pay for a lot of that work. So it's relatively low cost economic development in, uh, way for the state to to kind of increase transportation. We had a lot of folks in the committee from Oklahoma actually come and say, we would love to come to Kansas and spend money here and see all the great things Kansas offers. And this is is potentially a really cool way to do that. So I'm excited about that. Um, last week, we had a great turnout for Moms Demand Action Day in the Capitol, and we had a lot of people 
talking actively to legislators. We had people from all over the state. It wasn't just Johnson County showing up. People from all over the state there to talk to their legislators about common sense policies that the vast majority of Kansans support. And um, my bill 2413, which requires safe gun storage so that children and those not authorized to have a weapon has certainly received a lot of email support um, starting last night. So perhaps that will get the attention of leadership uh, that we would at least like to keep weapons out of the hands of children. And we'll see. Uh, on that, um, I was... Sorry. I was at Union Station. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want to talk about this, but I was probably 200 feet from where the shooting happened. And I got out. I was safe. Um, the people that were with me were all safe. Um, trying to get that communication was the hardest thing, making sure that we had five senators who were there and I don't know how many House members, and it was on both sides of the aisle, not just Democrats, um, but wanting to make sure my colleagues were safe. And while I wish I was optimistic that we could pass safe storage because we have stronger rules against pools and trampolines in our background, backyards. But one of my colleagues who was there wanted to take a moment of personal privilege. And the Senate president came to me and him, and he said, I need to know exactly what you're going to say because I don't want this to be political. And he wanted to acknowledge the first responders and the police officers who were there and thank them for what they did. And he wanted to share that there were 22 victims and he was being questioned whether or not that was accurate. So if we want to make change, sorry, we have to change the makeup, so I'm sorry. It's gonna give us a moment to <laughs> reset. Uh, I apologize, I feel a little insensitive moving into the next question, um, but I do want to ask the questions. Will Can Care make it up for a vote? So we have been promised a hearing in both the House and the Senate, and it will be after turnaround because we've got one week and it's not scheduled. Um, depending on what happens with a flat tax, um, but I think we will probably have a hearing, and it actually might be a legitimate hearing um, on the Senate side. Senator McGinn is supposed to chair that, um, but I honestly don't see any action on the floor. Um, I'd like to add March 6th is going to be advocacy day for that. So we would love to see people at the Capitol sharing the view, their views and the views of the, again, the vast majority of Kansans uh, support expansion. You know, we have another rural health care center in Eureka that's closing. What are we up to? Eight, nine that have closed since we failed to accept these federal funds, which, by the way, are your tax dollars which go to Washington, D.C., and then pay for somebody else's health care. So um, I'm always plenty happy to donate money to worthy causes like that. That is not the purpose of my tax dollars to fund other states' health care when we need that money here. We're at eight, seven, eight billion dollars now? Seven billion dollars we've given away to other states. So yay for us for being so charitable, but we have a lot of people that need help here. 
Um, I would suggest that you send an email to um, the Speaker of the House, Dan Hawkins, the President of the Senate, Ty Masterson, and copy your legislator. Um, if your legislator is not someone that is um, in favor of expanding Medicaid, also copy someone that is in favor of expanding Medicaid because we need to know that the emails are actually coming in so that people can't say, oh, you know what, nobody ever said anything to me about that at all. So always be sure to copy someone that you think is gonna be an advocate for your point of view. And then I have a couple more tied to health. Um, one, generally, what is being done to protect public health in the state? And then what is being done to prevent more drug overdose deaths in Kansas? Um, well, the, probably the best thing we can do to protect public health is to not let the bill that got a hearing uh, stripping public health officials of their uh, duties not let, let that go anywhere. So that'd be one thing. Um, in House Ed, we did <clears throat> hear and pass out a bill this week to increase funding for DARE education and to specifically include fentanyl education in that. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is it's stripping money out of children's fund, which funds things like parents as teacher and early interventions, which would actually help with drug problems later. But Let's just focus on the positive. Uh, the, it's come out of committee, and we'll see if it goes to the floor. So the Senate, I think, is the craziest of both chambers on these anti-health bills, and um, there is a slew of them in Senate health. Um, actually, the chair, I think she has a hearing on three bills on Monday. Again, we the last day to meet in committee and pass bills out is Tuesday, so she has three bills that she has hearings on on Monday, one on Tuesday, and there's like 10 bills she's trying to get out of those. Um, most of them are like the crazy, um, making sure the health, um, Secretary of Health doesn't have um, authority to contain, um, to stop spread of diseases and things like that. Um, also, the anti-vax bill is back. Um, so I think they will stop in the House, but um, they will definitely be heard on the Senate floor. And again, um, these are not the things that most Kansans are wanting, and um, that's what we're spending our time on there. There are bills that have been sitting in um, Senate Health. Um, one of them is a bill that I introduced um, for... Um, Newborn screenings. This is something we put in the proviso every year, but trying to put it in statute so that um, when babies are born, they go through those screenings and they're they're catching a lot of diseases and preventable um, illnesses early. And um, the chair will not even have a hearing on that bill because she thinks it's different from what is in the proviso, but it's exactly the same. But yet she spends days um, having these anti-health bills. As a mom of two toddlers, I am very concerned about the early childhood crisis in our state. What are each of you doing to support Co Governor Kelly's early childhood initiative? Yeah, we've got, I've, I'm, I'm the parent of two toddlers. We've got a four and a half year old and a four month old who just had um, avocado this morning, it was his first, first food he ever tried. So we had a big milestone in the Korsenbrovsky household this morning. Um, but no, I mean, we, we are feeling, you know, the pinch around childcare access and early childhood, just like so many families are in Johnson County. I mean, we actually, um, we were, are doing a kind of a budget in, a, in our family to kind of just better understand where our expenses are. And last night we were going through that and just the amount of money that we've spent on childcare for our four and a half year old and that we are going to be spending on childcare for our four month old is is astronomical. And I know that that's really affecting so many families in Johns County. So um, 
you know, I don't have any specific bills that I've personally introduced, but I am incredibly supportive of what Governor Kelly is trying to do and what Melissa Rooker at the Children's Cabinet and others are trying to do. So I've just tried to be a voice of support for their efforts um, because I think that they're really addressing a critical need in so many of our communities around just the cost, the availability of not just childcare, but really high quality childcare because we know that those ages from zero to five is where so much brain development takes place that folks don't want it just to be safe, they want it to be high quality. So I applaud those efforts, I'm supportive of those efforts and I'm hopeful that the legislature can, can move forward on that. Yeah, I would agree. I think everyone up here has been supportive of that. And um, one of the biggest things I think the governor is trying to do is streamline um, all issues of childcare under kind of one umbrella. I used to serve on the children's cabinet and that's where our tobacco settlement funds um, come through and then they're distributed for early childhood. And I think it was um, a good use of those funds and it has um, helped us set the stage for good things in our state. But um, when I was on there, we were looking at all of the funding sources that go to early childhood and um, it would take up probably this entire wall um, trying to pull where all of those funds are. And so the governor has the plan to kind of put all of this under one umbrella. So if you're a provider, um, you don't have to go to the Department of Education for some pieces and then the Department of Health and Environment for other. It would be kind of a one-stop shop. So getting rid of that bureaucracy and streamlining, it's not going to add any other FTEs because we're going to consolidate from the different areas. Um, and on the House side, I know Susan Kincan Representative Susan Kincannon, um, is it, what's her committee? Child Welfare and Foster, and um, that is where they expected this bill to go in on the House side, and um, it went somewhere else because this, the Speaker knew that she was supportive of this. Um, on the Senate, it was through Ways and Means, so I do think there is some movement there. But again, um, there's a lot of issues that are not being heard because we are really kind of waiting to see what happens with the flat tax. And as a member of Child Welfare and Foster Care, we were really looking forward to hearing that bill. Um, had everybody lined up and then it was gone. Um, but um, I'm in support of the governor's plan. I wish there was more we could do um, other than wait for somebody to bring it to the floor so we can vote. However, that's kind of where we are. Yeah, I fully support the governor's plan <clears throat> and I can't imagine actually voting against uh, child care spots or stripping that out of the budget as happened last week. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think um, when that D.A.R.E. bill came before education, my colleague David Younger from Ulysses, Kansas, did offer amendments to move that funding from the Children's Fund to the Attorney General's office, which that is where the position is in, is in the AG's office. So... Um, we tried that, we fought hard for that, that did not work, but um, you know, things still have to come to the floor and you just never know what happens on the floor. I also wanna add, I had introduced with Senator Blasey and actually um, Senator Corson also <laughs> introduced the same version for me, um, a bill for, so currently um, on the federal side, like if you, take child care deductions on the federal side, you can take 25% of those on your Kansas income tax return, and we're trying to increase that to 50. And um, there's other talk um, about increasing it even more. Um, but that is a bill out there. And then also, Kansas Actions for Children um, introduced a bill in tax, and um, it would go directly, so it's like a child care credit that um, you would receive, and it's based, I think, on your financial um, where you are, how much you would get, uh, and it's 18 and under, but the max would be 600 per um, student. So there are some good bills out there, but again, um, they're kind of stuck in tax um, where they're not really getting the um, effort that they need. But I, And there is bipartisan support for these bills. And we have a couple of education questions. I'm going to go ahead and pose them together. It's hard to believe that none of our Kansas legislative men members have had a child who benefited from a 504 or IEP. What do you think is at the root of disdain for fully funding special education? And then what is the argument made to justify cutting $100 million in education? 
Um, so again, I sit on that committee, and I actually had two kids who had IEPs, and um, I saw the benefits of what they what we were able to advocate for because of that designation. Um, yeah, I do not understand, um, except there is a faction of our legislature who want to dismantle our public schools. And um, by not paying, we know that our special eds, those dollars are getting to those students, but it's at um, the disadvantage of the students who are just in the regular classroom because they are required by law, federal law, to make sure that they receive those services. And so that, I think it was $72 million increase this year. And depending on um, the State Department of Education had a four-year phase in to get us to that 92%, and the governor had a five-year phase in um, to get to that 92%. And um, where we're seeing the biggest hurt is in our community. So Olathe, I think they're at 60%, if they're close to 60%. So we know that the special ed students are receiving the services that they need. They may not um, be, it may be harder for people to get into those services, which I think is another part of the conversation. Um, but there is a faction of our delegation um, who does not want to fund public schools. We had the task force for special ed that was bipartisan legislation last year. So in the interim, all summer they were supposed to be meeting. And um, honestly, the House member who this was their piece of legislation, they thought they were going to be able to chair this committee and um, kind of pick and choose who was able to testify and what was going to benefit, and when they realized that they did not have the votes to be, make sure that they were the chair, um, they never called the committee to meeting, and then other members um, kind of forced the issue, and they met on January 5th, and then on January 10th, they were supposed to have a report to the legislature, and so I think that was really showing that they don't want to figure out the solution, you know, if it's more money, if there are tweaks that we can make, they didn't even want to have that conversation. So then when all of that money was cut um, in the Senate on Thursday, um, it spoke very loudly that um, they don't want to fund our schools. And um, we will see what happens when it gets to the full floor for the budget. But we're, and I know I've got a stop sign, but... Um, we are under rules when we deal with a budget, which is PAYGO. So you can't add any more money into the budget. You have to have a shift because you can't um, add any other dollars. And so when we are faced with debating the budget um, to put that money back in, we're going to have to figure out where are we going to pull that $100 million from. One thing that I think has maybe kind of flown under the radar, but that I want everybody to be aware of is that, um, as some of you may know, probably do, two weeks ago, the Kansas Supreme Court uh, relinquished jurisdiction of the long-running school finance case. And so what had happened was there was, an, there was a decision reached in 2019, but the state Supreme Court at that time said, we are going to retain jurisdiction of this case because we are not confident that the legislature is going to follow through with funding in the amounts that we believe are adequate and equitable. So the Supreme Court kept jurisdiction of that case. So if there was a shortage of funding, um, we would not have to start an entirely new legal proceeding that would then have to work its way all the way up through our court system. We could immediately go back to the Supreme Court and say, Supreme Court, your decision is not being complied with. They no longer, they gave up jurisdiction of the case. So if there were in the future a need to bring a legal challenge to anything involving school finance or school funding, it would have to be an entirely new, new case, uh, which would obviously take a long time to wind its way through the court system. So that was really significant, and I'm not sure quite got the coverage that I think it deserves. Uh, what are you doing for with Senate Bill 373 to protect your community's public tax dollars from being given to public lobbyists to push special interests in the Capitol? 
I, I can talk about that because I think that's a bill in the tax committee. Um, I don't support that legislation. Um, the bill, just so folks are clear on what it would do, is it would say that um, basically the city of Lenexa, for example, that they could not hire a lobbyist with taxpayer dollars to be in Topeka to represent the interest of the city of Lenexa. Um, I think that's just wrong. I think that cities should be represented in Topeka. They should have the ability to make their voice heard. We hear and debate and vote on a lot of legislation that would impact our cities and our counties. So I think if a city at the council level decides that that is how they would like to use what is, to be candid, a very, very small portion of their overall funds, so they can have somebody in Topeka who can track legislation and understand how they'd be impacted by that legislation and can help explain to lawmakers like us exactly how different legislation would positively or negatively impact them. I think that's appropriate, so I don't support that legislation. Um, it's also not clear to me that that legislation is constitutional because you do have a constitutional right to petition your government for a redress of grievances, so that's generally been understood to to allow for lobbying. So I don't support it, and I'm not sure that it's even constitutional. Any interest in exempting Social Security free from state income tax, and is there anything in regards to property tax relief, especially for seniors? So I think every single one of us up here has supported um, either kind of doing away with that cliff, but I think we all also support um, all Social Security being exempt. I know I personally do those. You have paid taxes on those previously, and you should not um, pay taxes now. And there are two pieces of both of those pieces, property tax relief, So, and it's the 20 mills that goes to schools, um, currently 40000 of your um, house value is exempt from that 20 mils, and um, there are bills out there to exempt up to 100,000 of your property tax for that. And then the offset is kind of coming through SGF instead of your dollars. Um, both of those pieces are in the flat tax bill. They're also in the governor's um, tax relief bill. Um, and I think we all support that, and um, you know, if we have, to get to the place, um, we can try to pull those bills because I think they're also um, separate bills that are in committee, or and some may be even under the below the line, which is kind of a phrase of how bills get moved up to um, debate on the floor. Um, so there are some procedural motions that we can do trying to get some votes on those um, individually. Um, but again, because we are waiting to see what happens with that flat tax bill, um, those bills are not um, seeing any light of day. Yeah, I support the governor's bipartisan tax plan, which does include that relief. Um, I think it's really unfortunate when really good policies that we've heard a lot from our constituents about get linked to the flat tax, which has a higher fiscal note than the brownback tax experiment. We all know what that did for the state. Um, I'm sure you'll all get a postcard that says we voted against uh, lowering your property taxes, taking the tax. Yes, I'm not going to bankrupt the state for roughly $10 a month benefit for the average person in my district. That is not what my district wants. The district has been very clear. They want fiscal responsibility. They want schools. They don't want to see KDOT bankrupted again. They want to see social programs that could help children and families. So, um, you know, they can back us to the wall all they want on these things. They can, you can ask, well, would you pass flat tax if you could get Medicaid expansion? That is not how government should work. That is threatening and that is bullying and that is not how government should work. Run these policies clean to the floor and let the chips fall where they may. I feel as though if we could let every different tax portion of the tax plan run on its own merit, we would have amazing tax plans here. When they get bundled and thrown together, was it 29? Yeah. 29 pieces of um, tax, 29 different bills got lumped into one tax plan, and that's where things get messy. 
if we could just run things on their own merit, we'd have fantastic tax here in Kansas. One of the things that we've been, fo or I've been focused on rather with some of my colleagues in the in the tax committee is trying to address the issue of what we're doing um, with our fixed income seniors and our disabled veterans and trying to provide more relief for them to be sure that they can retire and stay in their homes. Um, we passed two years ago uh, a really good program, which is essentially a property tax rebate program. So it says that when you turn 65, um, if your if your income adjusted gross income is fifty thousand or less, and the assessed valuation of your house is three hundred fifty thousand or less, so those are the three criteria: sixty five, fifty thousand or less in income, and adjusted uh, pr property value of three hundred fifty thousand or less, the state will reimburse you for any increase uh, that you receive in your property taxes. That is current law. The challenge is that, as you know, in Johnson County that really does not help a huge number of folks who need that relief. You know, these are folks who bought their home 30 years ago for 150,000 and now it's assessed valuation is 450,000. They haven't made a major improvement. That's just been the market. So they don't qualify because they don't hit all three of those factors. So what I've been trying to do along with some of my colleagues is try to expand that program so we can bring in more people from Johnson County. So we are trying to uh, increase the income valuation up to $80,000 from $50,000, and we're trying to exempt from that $80,000 Social Security payments. So it's truly $80,000 or, or more in income. Uh, we are trying to raise the assessed valuation to $595,000. So we're trying to bring more people in uh, from Johnson County into what I think structurally is a really sound program. Again, we've got the bill, we've had a hearing on it, but we have not been able to pass it out of committee because we're just at this log jam when it comes to uh, bills being passed out of committee while the flat tax is pending. So, um, and I share what my colleagues have said with respect to the frustration of not being able to just have a simple up or down vote on the Senate floor on something like exempting Social Security uh, ta from taxation, which I support which I think is great policy, um, would pass probably unanimously if it was on the floor as a standalone bill. And so it's just a frustration that I think we all share with the process up there in Topeka, where we're not able to, to do those things uh, on just a, a simple up or down vote. Going back to that question about the lobbying, um, I think it's important to know that Johnson County, this is one of their priorities, and they have been talking about, you know, how do we get tax relief, and this was they have a platform that I think you all can all see, but this was a piece of their platform that they were advocating for for um, our Johnson County citizens. We've been hitting on the flat tax, but I, there's a very blunt question, so I'm going to ask it. Is there a reasonable chance that a tax reform package will be exacted without the flat tax included? Yeah, I am optimistic, and I actually have been having some conversations with um, other Senate colleagues, and we want to have tax relief, and the governor wants to have tax relief. She has said um, she will call a special session. So um, I think we will get there, um, but we are going to have to – the bills will not be put on um, for debate, so we're going to have to be strategic and figure out how to do that and um, use procedural – things that we have access to to um, bring that conversation because I don't think the leadership in the House or the Senate um, will bring anything if it is not their idea. And I've actually, the Senate president told me this is the only tax bill that he plans on working. So um, I think we can get there, but we're going to have to go against leadership to get something passed for the people of Kansas. Um, this one is addressed for Representative Featherston, but anybody that knows the answer can answer. What is the bill number regarding last Monday or the last Monday and Saturday before election day voting availability? I am horrible at bill numbers. <laughs> but I will look it up and let you know. A, a library staff member would also be happy to look it up. So, um, Hillary, will you raise your hand? She'll look it up, and if you have that question, she'll she'll have the answer for you. 
Do you see any hope for a hearing on House Bill 2413 or Senate Bill 137, safe storage, and should we be pushing more in the House or the Senate? All I can say is the bill is in an exempt committee. They can hear, hear bills at any time. That is leadership's decision as to whether a bill gets a hearing. So I'm going to keep pushing. I would suggest you keep pushing if that's a priority for you. My realistic self says probably not. Um, but you know, if we give up hope, and we quit lobbying for the things we value, you know, what's, what's the point of, like, my even going to work? Um, what's the point of you voting? What's, there's just no point. So I think it's important that we push onward and hold people accountable for the choices they make. I would agree with that, and there are several Moms Demand um, shirts in the um, audience. But I was there in 2017, I think it was 2017, maybe it was 2018, when we were able to keep guns out of our hospitals and our mental health hospitals. And that was because Moms Demand volunteers were there every day um, advocating for this and their presence. And so we were able to keep guns out of those hospitals. And um, it took a lot of work and um, they were not paid to be there, and they were there from 8 till midnight many times, sometimes after that. Um, so I do think your presence and advocacy does make a difference, um, but it is a steep hill that we have to climb. Okay. I'm going to shift gears. What is the current situation of the solar panel array proposed near Lawrence? Uh, concern expressed about the size and the impact. a county I think that's a county decision so I don't think we're part of that um, the solar panels we had in local government were for personal solar panels on your roof okay. um, outside of increased drug education is there any talk of furthering support programs alongside education um. The answer for me is, as a Senate Judiciary Committee member has been no. I mean, we have really focused on increasing criminal penalties. So we've done a number of sentencing enhancements for particularly fentanyl-related crimes. I supported all those. I think those are necessary, but I think that that is just one tool that we need to be using in a much bigger toolkit to combat things. So I would like to see, and this is maybe more of a budget issue, but I would like to see obviously more funding for mental health, more funding for addiction, uh, just more resources going to that. I think we've sort of had the hammer of, we just need to increase criminal penalties, again, which I support, but I don't think that's comprehensive. And I think we've probably fallen short in looking at this with a full 360 degree view of what really needs to be done to make a dent in terms of education, mental health, and addiction treatment. I would um, echo that. And I also would say, a lot of our schools, we used to do um, community that care surveys. I think that's the right name. Um, and we've kind of tied the hands of our school um, administration for being able to do any surveys, actually, in schools. And part of that is because there are people who think talking about social and emotional learning and talking about suicide prevention and um, drug use, like, that that puts these ideas in our children's head. And so I think we have to get over that because um, I know my kids were in Olathe schools and they were, before we put even more um, kind of guardrails about having surveys, um, they were able to get um, five kids in their school help because of a survey and being able to make sure that they had mental health. Um, and so when we are fighting that in education, making sure 
that teachers can talk about this, that counselors can come into the classrooms and make sure our children have those wraparound services that they need. Um, it's one thing to criminalize, and yes, we should be doing that, but we also need to be preventative. So we can't keep putting Band-Aids on. We've got to figure out where the solution is, and it's having access to mental health. Um, one of those things that um, we have mental health um, a pilot program in our schools, and I think we are in about 90 districts right now, um, but we only allow payment for community, community mental health centers, and our community mental health sister, sis, huh, <laughs> centers do excellent work, but they don't have the capacity to um, fill the need for everyone else. So um, one thing that in our budget in education, we did put a proviso to open that up for anyone who can offer mental health um, services. And so I hope we tried that last year in conference committee and the House member um, voted against that. Um, but we do have to look at how do we make sure that we have the capacity and it's being able to pay. There's also, a, you know, we're working with our um, funding codes um, for this CMH, uh, CMCs and making sure that we can use um, those codes to get reimbursement for our providers, and some of that's in school, some of it's not. Um, but that is a piece of the puzzle, and one that we are co constantly um, being pushed back against because um, trying to pick and choose who is gonna be able to do those services, and um, we can't pick winners and losers because anyone who can offer mental health um, access we should be making sure that they are able to be paid for that. I'll piggyback on that with the schools. Um, this is where fully funding special education comes in. We hear in committee all the time how desperately overworked our school counselors are. Like one counselor to four or 500 kids. And then it's suggested by members of the legislature that maybe we could save money by having those counselors like share between the high school and the middle school because they're right next to each other. That's not a solution. But here, if we could fully fund special education, the districts I represent, which are Shawnee Mission, Olathe, and Blue Valley, parts thereof, that's $50 million that would go back in those budgets that could go to hiring school counselors. Um, we had a teacher roundtable this week, and teacher after teacher said one of their biggest problems was children come to school without having their basic needs met. So we're meaning food, shelter, appropriate clothing, being clean, having an adult to supervise them outside of school. Until the legislature is willing to step up and resolve some of these issues instead of working to take SNAP an EBT away from children instead of an ag committee taking that amazing bill and putting a sunset on it. That bill would take fresh foods from our local farmers to the food pantry. Like, it's the best thing ever. But no, that costs a million dollars, which is nothing in the budget. I know that's odd to say, but, you know, we're so focused on we can't let government grow. Well, by golly, if it's going to feed some children and help resolve these core issues, I think that's money well spent. Okay, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna reduce response time down to one minute or less. We are surrounded by states that have approved medical or m recreational marijuana. What can you do about getting Kansas to move on this? I would love to say I can fix the whole thing, however, it um, is sitting with the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. And leadership is not a fan. Vote. Make sure everyone you know votes. Get all the young people in your lives registered to vote and make sure they vote and maybe send them a stamp so that they can get their absentee ballot back to the county. I'd say there has been conversations, and one thing that um, you know I'm conscientious of is a lot of people say they're not looking at patients 
um, like that perspective. We're looking at um, the providers and the producers, but not looking at how patients have access. So I think that's a piece of the puzzle that we need to have in conversations. And I think there is some conversations in the Senate in looking that there might be a pilot program in Wichita. Um, but again, I think if we're going to pass them, that we need to look at you know all pieces of the puzzle. And from what I understand, I have not even seen a bill um, on the Senate side yet, but just kind of the rumblings of what it's going to predict. They're not really looking at how does this help um, patients. Yeah, I mean, this this remains kind of a frustration for me up there with kind of Medicaid expansion and, and something that I think the overwhelming number of Kansans support and something that coupled with that I think would pass easily on the Senate floor if we just were able to give, be given the opportunity to have an up or down vote. So it remains a frustration. I think that there is a chance, as, as Leader Sykes said, that something may be done. I think whatever happens will be incredibly overly restrictive, but I think it can be a first step and it can be something that we can then build on going forward. So, you know, I'm inclined at this point to be supportive of, of almost anything within reason that will get the ball moving towards giving people access to what can be, um, you know, a, a positive for them in, in their medical treatment. So I think that's kind of where we'll go. It'll kind of be frustrating for us because it will be kind of unnecessarily restrictive. But again, if we can just get the ball moving, I think that we can come back in future years and and hopefully expand upon that work. So I'm hopeful that I'll have a chance to vote on it this session. We are out of time. I just want to thank our legislators for taking time out of their Saturday to be here. We very much appreciate it. And also thank you to you for taking time out of your Saturday to be here. Um, the library really believes in these kinds of events. And so thank you uh, for being here. We have plenty of donuts and coffee left. So please feel free to grab some on your way out. I also want to take a moment to invite you to all of the other legislative coffees. Even if your legislator's not here, they're all on different committees. They all have different expertise. I personally have attended all of them for 10 years, and I learned something at all of them, so I believe that you would as well. Thank you. Yeah. And then one last piece of information that might be of interest to people. Um, Donna Lawfer, if you could raise your hand. She, her Rotary Club is hosting Senator Schwab, so if you want information about that, connect with her at the end. Scott Schwab, Secretary, Secretary Schwab. Sorry, he used to be Senator, sec now he's now Secretary Schwab. Thank you. Did you, did you get the house? I'll let them know.